everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Watch No Evil. This is Matt. And this is Zach. And today we are going to be talking about the 1977 Italian supernatural horror film by Dario Argento, Suspiria. This is a classic film that takes place in Germany at a private ballet institution where Susie, the young American girl is slowly uncovering a diabolical plot, which is uh, murdering the students at this institution. For the benefits of witchcraft. It's interesting. It is witchcraft. The amount of witchcraftiness to it is very small. <laughs> it's, it's a very simple kind of witchcraft. Yeah. You know, I was thinking before we were doing this, it's really interesting that just by happenstance, we picked another movie with a centralized female focus. Oh my god, we did it again. Yeah, but did you also see what Argento refers to this movie as? It's the Three Mothers trilogy. Oh yeah! This is a really interesting film in that there are really no... <laughs> there's no, like, mother in the same way that we've sort of, like, thought about matronhood in previous movies that we've watched so far. But in this one, there is sort of this, like, inherent matronly figure of ballet. Because ballet, though it does show male ballet dancers in this, the ballerinos, ballet is a largely female-dominated institution and most ballet teachers are women and so there is something sort of matronly about the ballet educational system it's very very tough on you it's mm -hmm. almost loveless or withholding in some ways and i think that that's really accurately represented in this movie although possibly unintentionally for those of you who don't know, I am a ballet accompanist, so I play piano for ballet. So I've been in ballet lesson and ballet classes, and so this movie has things that speak to me on the level of uh, understanding of ballet culture. Also, I got really mad when they started a class with the ending tours, and I was like, they wouldn't do that. Hey, it's Germany. You don't know. <laughs> I do know. They don't do that. You don't You don't begin a class with cross floor work. Well, you also don't start a witch coven with the cover of a ballet school. <laughs> so. You know, that's true, too. And I, I wonder about that one thing. What was the goal of having the coven there? Was it to recruit young girls as well? I... I think so, because I kind of got that vibe from the one girl, Olga. Mm -hmm. She's just kind of like creepy and you know, she's painting her nails red. Yeah, and red was the way that they were sort of symbolizing witches. Well, I don't, I don't know if that was so much it, but I thought of it more because there's a lot of color usage and symbolism in this movie. And I don't know if all of it is truly like cut and dry symbol. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we think of the classic image of a witch. We think of someone wearing black and riding a broomstick and, you know, with a black cat or whatever. Mm -hmm. And pretty much in all the all the scenes, the, all the teachers and the staff were wearing black. They were wearing black and they were also bathed in red. And also green. You, th you know, there's that green. also that like image of green skin. So I think that may have been and and the green light only showed up when they're like speaking of witchcraft yeah and it has this there's this sort of uh juxtaposition between violence and repulsion like disgusting like using green as a depictor of the maggots like it showing up then as being like a gross thing also this film uses the same technicolor technique that the wizard of oz did with of course the witches in the wizard of oz being green except for glenda the good witch like and who knows about that the idea of of the the green witch being then represented in this highly highly colorful saturated palette in this film it, it makes sense to sort of have the two be used back and forth. I think that that was a, a really nice contrast compared to the daylight scenes, which were very muted. And it was, I think, a way to emphasize safety. They used a limited color palette and a little bit more realistic and a little bit more earth tones during the day. 
But like right from the beginning, when we see the night outside of the Freiburg Ballet Academy, we're getting these wild Technicolor shots that are supposed to engage us on that like primitive coloristic danger warning sign. You know, you see a bright red snake and you're like, I think that snake's poison. Yeah, I think a lot of what he was trying to accomplish with this was to create this primitivist aesthetic. Mm -hmm. You notice the colors that are used, they're like the primary colors, red, yellow, and blue are pretty much the ones are used the most. We do get that green. You know, we, we often kind of think of green as like the fourth primary color, even though it's a mixture of yellow and blue. But it's like these bright colors, what you're saying is is like that kind of thing that we recognize in nature is like bright colors usually mean that something is, is dangerous and that activates kind of like this fight or flight response. And that kind of goes along with the off-kilter cinematography and the jarring but ethereal sound design like you always get the soundtrack going and sometimes it's very very classical like in the ballet classes Mm -hmm. that we're we're like all right very sophisticated but then a lot most of the time and especially during the night scenes where we get these bright flashes of color there's that really primitive off-putting yeah and i wouldn't even say the music itself is like really primitive by any means but it's this repeating kind of like hypnotic it just makes you feel like it's from a different time the repetition of what is clearly a skin drum and in this more wooden percussion sound and then on top of that you have post-verbal wailings that are not supposed to be recognizable as speech. And I think that they're supposed to be so that when they say things in the music, like later on, you know, they'll say like witches in the music, it actually comes out understandably because there is sort of this like evolution. And I think it, it relates to the historic nature of Helena Marcos, the headmistress of the Ballet Academy or the head witch of the coven. In the same way that it it used that sort of almost primitivist percussive sound to denote Hess's immortality in Ganja and Hess. Yeah, for sure. It's it's I think a lot of it's just to like conjure up this idea of oldness mm-hmm. that we've talked a lot about. Specifically in vampire movies we talk about it a lot, but we haven't really done any witch movies before and sometimes in these movies we see that their motivation is that fountain of youth using their witchcraft to transcend their mortality which is why i was wondering if the ballet school part of it was that they were harvesting the the youth of the ballet students which i think is that also a really interesting conceit because ballet it's basically all about youth ballet is such a difficult and dangerous sport because it works your muscles and tendons in your legs your your ankles so specifically that most people can only do it for a certain period of time like they will have joint problems or they will have ligament problems later on in life it's it's similar i think in a way to like opera singers it is so physically demanding that it it sort of kills your longevity and so there is a Mm. real emphasis on the youthfulness of ballet the flexibility that one has the ability to move and contort in ways that are specific to the grace and so i think that it's a neat parallel between the idea of the witch coven here which is essentially immortal and the culture of youth in ballet institutions yeah i definitely think that's why the front is the ballet rather than thinking of it as this sisterhood thing that we often apply to witch covens Mm -hmm. uh, because there are men in this coven as well they don't tell you a lot about the witches i mean they really save the witchiness of it until the end we don't ever see them doing anything ritualistic or magic e we only really see like the magical element come into play at the very end when helena marcos reanimates the corpse of sarah the one who fell into the quote unquote razor wire the one thing that made me think of kind of like that sisterhood idea behind a witch coven was the dormitory scene Mm -hmm. and that's like i think just relating those two ideas and and creating that kind of uh, association in the mind of the viewer i think was the only purpose of that scene because i thought it was so weird how they had this series of events that seemed like it was leading to something big 
like Susie was going to stay at Olga's apartment. Then she mysteriously faints during the ballet class. So then, oh, no, now you have to stay at the school because we want to monitor your health. Mm -hmm. So it's like, ah, they've trapped her at the school. They want her for something. And then there's the MAGA infestation in the bedrooms that then they're like, oh, everyone has to sleep in dorms right now because there's these maggots that are coming from nowhere in in the uh, whatever hallway with all their rooms in it. So then you get like, oh, they've, they've got her into this situation where there's this dormitory with all these girls and, and, and you expect something to happen. The only thing that really happens is the introduction of the Helena Marcos legend from Sarah. And the figure of her breathing behind the sheet. Right. And I, at first, like, I, I was asking while we were watching this, I'm like, is this a hazing thing? Like, are they trying to scare her? But that wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. It just seemed like something more was supposed to happen. At least a jump scare that was, you know, like fake. So I think that's another one of those things that triggers that primal fight or flight response in the viewer. After nothing happens, it's like you kind of get this false sense of comfort. Mm -hmm. And then things start happening. More people start dying. I think it's right after that that Daniel, pianist, he ends up getting fired because of his dog and then he gets killed afterwards. Yep, the dog turns on him and tears out his throat. Yeah, which is... I mean, definitely some witchcraft there because, you know, he was adamant about, oh, this dog would never hurt anyone. And what's weird is, you know, there's that little boy who is clearly part of the coven. Mm -hmm. There's that scene where him and one of the chefs are walking up to the school and there's Daniel's dog sitting outside. And the boy's looking at this dog like, oh, that dog's going to attack me. I know it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if it's because, like, he has this dark magic in him or something. The dog senses evil. Either that or they got the dog to attack him so that then they could get rid of Daniel. But that doesn't really make sense because Daniel seemed like he was kind of like on the inside of it. Yeah, he definitely seemed like he was on the inside of it because ballet school, they're always looking for a pianist to play. I mean, it's a very specialized skill that I have. So if anybody listening to this needs a ballet accompanist, my email is, and I'm going to stop there. But yeah, I think that it's interesting that they characterize Daniel as a blind pianist. It's a little heavy handed. He's blind to what's going on at the school. But the dog is not. The dog senses the evil of the school, especially as it is seen in Albert, attacks Albert. And then obviously Daniel is is punished for it. You know what this movie reminds me of? The song Dance Dance by Fall Out Boy. <laughs> You know, because there's that one lyric, dance, dance, the maggots will fall from the sky. You know that one? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's right right after the bridge. Yeah, right after the bridge. So, you know, it's it's the B-side. It's the uncut. You know, Dario Argento was actually one of the original members of Fall Out Boy. And he also became a large manufacturer of cheese. Mm Mm-hmm. Sargento. Dominic Sargento. This is a this is such an interesting movie too. There are relatively few kills, but I think that they do a good job of making the kills relatively striking, especially that first one. That first one is so good. So damn good. It's complete overkill. <laughs> yeah, literally. Well, it's like so brutal. There's no better word for it than brutal. Yeah. And I think that, again, going back to this primitivism that is so prevalent, Mm -hmm. how else do you get such a visceral reaction from your audience, like, in the opening scenes of a movie, more so than this? (laughs) She gets gets stabbed several times, and we get that shot of, like, her heart being punctured. And then her head's pushed through that glass. That's a haunting image. Yeah. I like that you called it overkill because it literally is overkill since they accidentally kill another person in the killing of her. Yeah, she didn't have a witch curse on her. Right, exactly. (laughs) Totally unfair, but I think interestingly that it was also inspired by The Wizard of Oz. We're just like the witches get their vengeance by having glass fall on someone rather than a house. I mean, that that could be. I mean, clearly they took inspiration in the way that they filmed it with that tri- or it was a technicolor, tricolor, whatever tricolor, yeah. way of coloring the film. But mm-hmm. also, I read that Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was actually an inspiration for this. And I think just the, the witchcraft elements of it, as well as how red is so prevalent in that movie as well. Mm-hmm. But there's also like kind of that the old witch that is trying to 
kind of hex this younger girl. We see some of that here. Going along with this off-kilter, primitive kind of fight or flight viewing of it let's talk about cinematography Mm -hmm. because there is so much movement with the camera like the camera hardly ever stays still which is a very very much like ballet as well and we get so many like strange camera effects and angles that's something we can always appreciate in the horror genre we get such unique cinematography in this genre Mm -hmm. it's great when we get a film like this where they really run with it but the most striking in the dormitory scene was one of the times where there was like this weird skew to the camera focus that i can't quite put my finger on but it was like the very edges of the screen it was shrunken like vertically Mm -hmm. so it's like this this weird skew like suddenly the ratio is off yeah at the very edges of the screen and they did that later but the skewed part of the screen was bigger so it kind of had this fisheye effect to it and that was when Susie, you know she was like trying to escape the school after she kills helena part of german expressionist art specifically in the era of like german expressionist filmmaking like even that uh, that we discussed in the, the babadook part of the set design and the cinematography and the dressings of that is to create impossibly angled shots by bringing the camera lower to the ground To make it seem like the walls and such are higher than they actually are. And one of the things that I wrote down with this film is that as it goes on, we get closer and closer shots to Susie. The height of the actual walls around her slowly start to collapse inward over the whole course of the film. Keeps getting tighter and tighter which is supposed to be referential to the fact that she's getting caught in sort of the web of what's going on at the ballet school, both figuratively and literally, in that they are now essentially forcing her to stay at the ballet school. Like, they keep Mm -hmm. bringing her closer and closer to the danger, and in that it gets a little bit more claustrophobic. They do the same thing whenever a character is about to die. They have wide space at the beginning of their narrative, And then they pull in really closely to them. So Daniel, for example, that is, I think, the most exaggerated use of that. But Sarah, it does the same thing. We see wide angle shots of her or like large shots of her when she's like stacking those suitcases to try and get out through that window. Far shot. We get the mid shot, which is when she's like flailing in the razor wire. And then in her death scene, we get the real super close-up of her throat. Some review I was reading about this, I think Critic put it really well, like this whole movie feels like it's this dreamlike quality. Yeah. The concept of reality is kind of skewed mm-hmm. as well. And she does eventually figure out that the wine is drugging quote unquote, her. Quote-unquote wine. <laughs> that, yeah. yeah. And then you get, we get that scene of her pouring it down the sink and it's like the thickest wine you've ever seen. This wine dummy thick. Wine is much more watery than that. Mm. I don't know. I bet it was just like pure corn syrup that was in there. So she figures out the the wine is being drugged in, and then she's finally able to stay awake, which was another thing that kind of she can't stay awake whenever Sarah wakes her up to air her insecurities about their situation. Mm -hmm. It's funny how you mentioned Daniel earlier, how he's literally blind and he's kind of blind to what's going on in the school because with Susie, her inability to stay awake is kind of like her blindness of what's going on in the school. And then once Sarah dies and Susie becomes more suspicious and more discerning, she has no problem staying awake. And of course, it's because she's not drinking the wine anymore, but I think that's, you know, it's, it's kind of like a double meaning there. And then she gets attacked by the bat. Yeah, I don't know what the bat... I don't know about the bat. I don't know what the bat's supposed to be. That, I mean, that's another, like, Halloween-y type image that yeah. we associate with witches. And I think that's really all it was besides a time waster. That scene was hilarious. I actually thought that it was supposed to be a little vampire misdirect. Like, ooh, it's a, it's a bat. Bats drink blood. Bats are vampires. Like, that's what I was thinking. I very well could have been. I don't know if it's so much of a misdirect because we get the the music going on mm. and witch and it's like this is clearly about witches they said the word witch like yeah they they five do minutes into the movie they do ruin that i don't i wish that they yeah i wish that they hadn't done that you could have said a different word bitch like, no um <laughs> <laughs> like magic or i don't know like anything magic 
Ooh, Swan Lake is overrated. But yeah, it uses the Celeste in the score to like basically be a knockoff Nutcracker, I think, uh, which I love. I, I Yeah, I like that about it. Because it's obviously not using the Nutcracker or Tchaikovsky melodies, but it is using something that is clearly melodic and it is contrapuntal. It is classical, which so starkly contrasts the rest of the score that I think that it's really important for the movie because it actually gives you like a sense of of ballet-ness to it or like decorum in a way that the other music intentionally neglects. I would agree because this is the like the celeste kind of ostinato repeating thing that happens whenever there is witchcraft. It's always right before someone dies or during their death. It's so interesting because we do get those kind of like sophisticated new world finishes to the music there as opposed to just like the tom drums because we we do get the those kind of like western elements it's almost like a hint at like hey the ballet is part of it It, it's almost like you're you're pulling back the curtain to reveal what the ballet school really is Mm -hmm. and that is what this this music is this mystery and this this primitive witchcraft and and dark magic behind it yeah And it's interesting, too, there's so many symbols of illusion or of misdirection throughout the movie that I think it sort of alludes to the fact that it is supposed to be this, like, hidden secret in plain sight. And I think that that starts with the optical illusions that are painted on the wall in the hotel room. The first character is staying at, you know, the swans and the fishes. And then the actual large-scale mural, which is this M.C. Escher sort of painting with art archways and stairs that also has the irises on the front that actually are a secret door to entering Helena Marcos's inner chamber. Even the way that these like repeated patterns are painted on walls throughout the film, like the actual symbols and the decor sort of give this sense of like hidden mystery in plain sight there's a lot of stuff that is designed to look like eyes as if watching it's really heavy on the cinematography but also the design of the set i think is as important to telling the story as the color is yeah for sure well and you mentioned these shapes and you know we get a lot of repeating patterns uh shape wise and sound wise Mm -hmm. i think these shapes are reminiscent of witchcraft runes the way that they are said to like cast spells and we get these satanic circles that some witches are said to use so i think this is all implying yes of the witchcraft the amount of red paint they must have used for this set it's everywhere and that is another thing that permeates the setting and the mood and just the overall atmosphere and the feel of this you know like red is not a calm color red can be used to symbolize a lot of things evil passion color red is is part of i think the reason that this movie stands out so much because it it is so in your face And it's so saturated. The density of that like red spectrum is wild. It's not just like a hue that they put over everything. Because, you know, in like horror movies, we're sort of used to this like weird, like uh, sickly blue tint over everything. The same thing with Conjuring, that like yellowish tint that's over the whole film. But this, it's like, it's not a tint. It is, it is like brush strokes of red. It's vibrant. Yeah. And disturbingly so. Mm-hmm. That That's the thing. It's like, it. red is a color that means anything but calm. That goes along with everything we've been talking about with this. It's like, a lot of things in this film are meant to keep you on edge the whole time. And going back to soundtrack too, there is almost constantly some music going on in the background, unless there's like some important dialogue. But also there's all this camera motion. There's this literally nonstop tension and you're just going, going, going and you never quite feel like you're safe. Like I said at the beginning... I think it activates some sort of like primitive danger sense in the back of our mind that's like bad, red, bad, red poison, bright colored flower, bad. Except roses. Roses pretty. But they got thorns. Red, bad. That's true. You're also, you really shouldn't eat roses. (laughs) There's a lot of red. Like I said, it permeates and it comes from very early on. The red light as Susie is arriving from the airport, like in the airport, and she comes out of that red light. They just, from the get go, they're like, here is what you're dealing with. Here is the tone that we are going for and you're going to deal with it. And I appreciate that. Didn't ease us into it. 
But what I find interesting about all the red in this is they talk about the red room and the yellow room. And we do get to see the yellow room. That's where they kind of have the rehearsals. But we never get to see the red room, right? Right. One of the directors, uh, assistant director, said that the third years have their rehearsals in the red room. And I wonder if these are the, the ballerinas who are kind of reserved to like maybe be initiated into the coven. Right. Like they've made it far enough and they haven't yeah. Question things enough to be able to see the red room and, and rehearse in the red room. Maybe they're being taught more than ballet there, you know. Yeah. But this is going back to what you said earlier of like you know this this idea that ballet is like this. You must be like young, young and dedicated. Like you said, it's like loveless. Yeah. And we've kind of come like in modern society, we've kind of come to equate ballet with like you must dedicate all of your being to this. There is this mentality of this is all you are, mm-hmm. and you know if you aren't completely dedicated to dancing, then you know we're probably just gonna kill you. Which they did. They seem to really only kill out of convenience. I, I think is a way to protect their institution also something that we thought was strange about it was you we, we first started watching the movie and you're like is this dubbed and it doesn't look like they're quite saying what they're saying so all of the actors in the film speak in their native tongue and then they dubbed everyone into english even if the actor was speaking english they still dubbed it into english <laughs> It's so weird. But apparently that was like the thing to do. The trend yeah. at the time in, in Italian film. I wonder if that was like when Italian filmmakers kind of decided to go for a more international audience that they started doing that. Yeah. And why did they decide that that was the most effective and efficient way to do it? Yeah. Uh, is, is kind of strange. I feel like part of it had to have been that like fear of the multicultural, especially with like movies being released to a mainstream American audience like like American audiences, they just suck. They don't want to watch anything <laughs> yes. that has subtitles in it. They don't want to watch anything that has foreign languages. I mean, it it does get incredibly annoying. And I mean, it's only just recently that we've started to even break out of that boundary. Like so many people saw Train to Busan getting a larger American release. And almost immediately people were like, oh, they need to just remake this movie with American actors so that it's in English. And it's like, that's not the point. And you're destroying a perfectly good movie. Or look at the number of people that got really mad about Parasite. God forbid a foreign movie gets attention. Yeah. And wins an but it did it deserved that oscar i love that movie and and i know this wasn't like an artistic choice by any means but this dubbing is another thing that is off-putting about this film so it, it, it it's kind of like covertly contributing to the atmosphere of it let's, let's talk about the ending okay so susie goes down into that secret passage and she sees them trying to curse her and and send sick helena on her it looks like how they're conducting the witchcraft is they're drinking helena's blood that's what i was thinking too and and like that's their way of channeling her power because she is like the head um witch of the coven like you said so and and the head witch of a coven is always like i think it's said that it's like nine times more powerful than any other witch or something they're the supreme and she's very much the the mother figure of it because you know so much stronger and you know we're talking about the matronly Mm -hmm. kind of implications here but and then she she goes after helena she kills her and then everything starts shaking and moving around and she's it's like the it's like the old self-destruct sequence which which makes this like kind of the second self-destruct sequence scene that we've seen um and she gets out of there and then it bursts into flame there's this like a self-immolation idea yeah well and the one psychologist who said that like tells her about helena marcos and says that she died in a fire i wonder if that was like a premonition because that's sort of like the the witch stereotype right they we know of witches because of that that's how you kill a witch you have to burn a witch if you put them in water Water, the witch won't drown you have to you know you have to burn the witch alive to kill it i think that that part a little bit of it was like you know mythology mixed with not mythology <laughs> it's it's another like you know old mix with the new yeah. kind of idea speaking of that that psychiatrist guy Boy, did I hate his presence in the movie. He was really just an exposition dump. The good part about his scene is it was an opportunity to give the audience some relief from that, like, color blast and the focus on the school. 
it showed the like safety of daylight and norm like the normalcy of the outside world so that the juxtaposition back to the school is again suddenly very mystical i just wish that it hadn't been like a, an exposition dump but yeah so so the end happens and then you know as soon as you see the fire like burst out there it's credits rolling and there's this like remixed version of that celeste ostinato theme mm-hmm. going on that was just banging i want to add that to my workout playlist yeah goblin did a crazy good job with the score for this which uh goblin is a is a prog rock band very very 70s interestingly i found out that the film score was made before the film really he has like a long-term association with goblin because they also did the score for deep red uh but claudio and dario are also both they're both writers they both worked on movies by brian de palma and george romero i just wanted to read a little bit of the review that i found on this that i thought really some summed up the movie really well okay uh so this is peter and I, i'm sorry if i butcher your name but sobzinski wrote a review on RogerEbert.com. he said this film is a riot of sound fury and imagery that somehow managed to come across as both gruesome and poetic it was unlike anything i had seen before and even though i cannot count the number of times that i've viewed it over the years i continue to come away from it stunned by its combination of visceral horror and visual beauty end quote i think is a great way of viewing ballet as well yeah. especially modern modern ballet modern ballet is sick definitely this movie i think is yeah. very very well done great atmosphere just like uh we talked about last week with alien it's really a classic and it's really a standout and while the acting is largely subpar the atmosphere the cinematography the set design the soundtrack so many other parts of it have made it this really unique and really influential gem a red gem yeah. <laughs> Thank you everyone for listening to this week's episode of Watch No Evil. This is Matt. And this is Zach. And remember, live like there's no tomorrow, love like your heart's never been broken, and dance like somebody's watching.